The elders uh, and ministry leaders have been prayerfully planning and asked that you would pray for us as well, you know, as we get back to somewhat of a norm in our Sunday morning services. Uh, as you know, uh, the governor's requirement has been set at around 50% or less of our sanctuary capacity. And as we approach this weekend, uh, we're asking that you would please RSVP to our, uh, our service using the link on our website. And this, what this does is it allows us to, um, well, to get the proper numbers, to know where we're going, to arrange our sanctuary, and to just to gauge the number of guests that we'll be attending. And again, we'll be limited to about 150 chairs. So, um, but this is just for this phase one, and we'll pray through that phase two happens quickly. We pray, again, we want to pray for those who are sick. Uh, we want to pray for those who are mourning the, the loss of loved ones through this. But we also want to do what's best for everyone and the, sitting, the, the seating situation and just how things will roll. We'll continue our virtual Sunday school for the kids into the summer and we'll inform you when our youth ministry will open up in the future. But once we reach capacity, please know that you can still join us online via one of our Calvary at Home platforms, Facebook, YouTube, website, app. It's, it's one of the things uh, that we've seen during this time is we've gotten a little bit better and more informed and we're continuing to grow in this process of live platforms. And so we'll still be um, going live on the different platforms, and you can still watch to, watch us. Uh, Wednesday evening live gatherings, well, it's still going to be on a pause for a time being, but we'll broadcast again online. So, again, we're walking through this. Please pray for us. Please have patience. Please walk with us as well. We want to encourage everyone to show you know abundant grace, and I know you will as we transition back, because there will be those who are just eager to return. (laughs) We know that. But then there will be those who want to take a more cautious approach, and that's okay. We've been telling you that's fine. I mean, I think this is just a great great opportunity to show unity, and we'll be talking about Christian attitude, Christian unity this Sunday in Philippians. And uh, it'll just show our love to one another when we come back here on Sunday. I just want to remind you of a few key things uh, regarding our Sunday live service. Number one, again, there will be no kids' classes, nursery, none of that. Children are welcome to come with their families. Uh, We have uh, these little bags for, for children. We call them busy bags, and they'll be provided for the little ones, and you just take that bag home. We don't need the bags back. Masks are not required, but encouraged for those who feel comfortable wearing them. There will be some masks available um, if you need one when you attend and keep it. And it's a great mask. You can keep them. You know, I got mine. You know, walk into places and they, you know, you know, I'm not a bandit, but you can keep yours and wash it and come back. But if you have one, bring it. Bring your own mask if you feel like. That's going to keep make you more comfortable, as uh, you know, in coming to church. These sanctuary chairs are going to be strategically placed for social distancing. So please sit with your households uh, as you come in as a family. You all can sit together because you've been together anyway. But also, again, we need to practice that social distance from from others. So please work with us. Work with the ushers. As it gets, starts to get full, the ushers will be assisting you on where to, where to sit. Uh, again, there will be no coffee bar. There will be no food available or made. If you want to bring your own uh, coffee, you can. Um, so you can do that, but none of that will be available. But anyway, there's more points. I don't want to go through and bore you with all this, but uh, just see our email, our social media posts on our website, 
the things we sent out to you. Somebody emailed us, said, you know, I haven't received an email. Can I get it? Well, if you're on uh, the, uh, uh, the way we control, what's that? Planning. planning Center. If you're on Planning Center and your email's in there, you should be getting an email. Right, Matt? Yeah. We're all live, live. We're live right now, man. Uh, so uh, if, if your email's in Planning Center, then you should be getting emails. Uh, and if you're saying, yeah, it is, but I'm not getting them, check your junk box or your, uh, you know, the other boxes that maybe it's going to there. But uh, let us know. It's going to be on our website as well and all of our media. But anyway, thank you guys uh, ahead of time for your willingness to follow these guidelines. We're trying to do the best we want. We can. We want to keep you guys safe. We want to obey the Lord. And in obeying the Lord, we want to be of the word and you know, obey those authorities over us, you know. So uh, we just want to, you know, do what's best for everybody. So thank you for your patience. Thank you uh, for continuing to pray for us. Well, as, as I said, let's turn to First Kings chapter 4. We are going to be taking uh, communion tonight. So you want to get your elements together. And I'm going to show you how to use these things because this is another thing that's going to change at least for a while. This is the way communion is going to look like. You know, some of you are familiar with, I'm going to teach you how to do this, and I'll teach you again, or we'll teach you again when we come to a communion Sunday morning service. But uh, it's pretty interesting how they package these things. But they are they are packaged, and they're, I guess you could say they're safe. Uh, so make sure you get your elements ready at home so we can take communion together. With all of that, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for gathering us here. Thank you for all those who are gathered in their homes, Lord God, and their dwelling places tonight and have turned on their apparatuses, Lord, their televisions, their iPads, their phones to to check in and to prepare to study for the Word of God, Lord. And Father, you have already spoken to us. You have already moved us through the worship. And now, God, we want to worship you through your Word. And I ask God that you would speak to us tonight in this interesting chapter of 1 Kings, God. Lord, we've come to hear from you. We want to have the application, God. And we ask that you would speak to us. Remove anything that may, uh, Lord, hinder us from hearing and reading your word right now, God. We ask this in Jesus' precious name, and every household said, amen. Well, last time we were together, we remember that Solomon was now on the throne, and uh, he realized the great responsibility that he had now as being the king, imagine, the king of God's people, the the under king, we could say. For God is the king himself. And he realized the, the large responsibility. In chapter 4, he, he, he spoke with God. And God had asked Solomon, ask of me what you need. Ask of me what it, you need as you begin this role as the king. And we know that uh, in this, as the Lord appeared to him, it was in a dream that Solomon had asked for wisdom. He was very humble at this point. He goes, Lord, I, I, I don't know how to go in or go out. Go out. I, I, I don't know how all this is going to, what's going to take place. I'm like a little child, he says. Uh, I, I just, Lord, I... Please give me an understanding heart. Uh, and the original it actually means a hearing heart. As we always say, Lord, give us ears to hear. Well, really, it's give us a heart to hear. Because things can go in your ear, right? But are they going into your heart? Are, are, are you heeding and obeying? He says in there, in chapter 3, uh, chapter three actually, verse 9, you know, therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. Boy, isn't that a great request? 
And, and, he, and he says, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? You know, as ministers, as pastors, Peter tells us that and reminds us, and the Bible reminds us that this, the church, the people, it's God's people. It's God's church. We're just under shepherds. We're, we're just laborers for the Lord, man. You know, God says, take your, you know, you know, take care of my, of my people. And Solomon understood this. And God said this, look at verse 10 of chapter 3 again, just to review, that, that this speech pleased the Lord. I love that. That's my goal. That's our goal, isn't it? To please the Lord to the best of our ability. That he says, because Solomon asked this. And God said in verse 11 of chapter 3, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. I am going, he says in, in, ver, chap, in verse 12, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you wise and understanding heart. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that laid out for us in chapter 4. He says, so there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. Bottom line is this, Solomon, you were not self-centered. You didn't ask anything of yourself other than, Lord, I'm broken before you. I have this great responsibility. Just give me wisdom. Give me guidance. Give me direction. And God says, that's what I love. I love those who are broken before me. Because those who are broken before me, I can build up. I can use. I can, as, as the potter, I can form them and, and guide them. And they depend upon my hands, my holy hands upon their life. God says he was pleased with that. And this is the neat thing, guys. When we get our eyes off of self and onto God, he blesses us even more with things we never even ask for. It's true. He even says it here. Even though you didn't ask for riches, I'm going to bless you with riches. Even though you didn't ask for people to honor me, I'm going to, you're going to get the honor. Because where your heart is at this point is I know that those riches and those honors are going to just be given right back to me in a sense. What we give from God, we give back to him. And he says again, and there, there's going to be no one like you among the kings of all your days. If you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments. He says, as your father David walked. And it's interesting, God doesn't bring up David's past sins. He doesn't bring up David's fail, failures. He know, God knows that we are feeble people. God knows that we're sinners, that we fail many times. But he also knows that those who have a heart to, to pray, to seek forgiveness. For David, well, for David, remember, he had to be his sin had to be unveiled before him. And sometimes that happens, doesn't it? But let me tell you, when David was exposed, I'm going to tell you what, the enemy had nothing on him anymore. You know, sometimes those of us who are still dealing with something that we haven't really confessed and been broken before God, man, the enemy keeps us hostage, doesn't he? That happened with David until he... God loved them so much, he exposed them. But here, notice again in chapter 3, verse 4, I'm not going to teach the whole chapter, we really taught it last week, but he says, if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Not only is he going to bless him with riches, not only is he going to, he's going to be honorable in the sight of men because of his wisdom, but God says, I'll even lengthen your days, man. Isn't that awesome? Those are great promises. And with that, now we come to chapter 4. And chapter 4, verse 1, begins this way. So King Solomon was king over all Israel. That's a great statement. Because there will be the only time a king will be a king of all of Israel, right from the start. 
Now you say, well, wait a minute. David was the king of Israel. Yes, but that was after seven years of reigning in Hebron and reigning only as the king over Judah. Remember that? We studied it. And then after that, he was accepted by the northern kingdom. And it was after those seven years that he reigned um, with, uh, as the king of all of Israel. But now here we see that Solomon begins his reign, uh, his blessed reign over all Israel. And we'll mention the boundaries of all, <laughs> of all of Israel here in a minute as we read through this. We're going to mention the boundaries that God give, gave Israel. And, and I'll give you a little hint, they're still theirs. It's still Israel's. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But again, sadly, this will be the last time a king will reign over all of Israel until the second coming of Jesus. Amen? That's right. The king of kings himself, when he comes back to earth with ten thousands of his saints, of his, with, his, with ten thousands of us saints, of the church, and he comes and he takes his rightful place during a time that's called the millennial. And for a thousand years, he will reign here upon this earth. That's going to be wild, man. Imagine coming back to Fredericksburg. <laughs> coming back to, uh, to our hometowns and trip out on that. You know. But anyway, that will be in Israel. That will be there in Jerusalem. So Solomon is blessed. And, and he and Israel are enjoying, listen, the fruits of the king's labor. He, Solomon is in a place where his dad, as we studied his life, man, you talk about labor and wars and warfare and ruling and trials and tribulations that David went through. It was because of his father's consistent um, consistency in, in serving the Lord, not perfect, but his consistency in serving the Lord, the battles that he fought the, for the Lord the, and for the people, now Solomon gets the fruit of that. He gets to uh, be blessed by leading Israel through the fruit of King David's labor service. Verse 2, it goes on to say there, and these were his officials. Now, he's going to set up a cabinet, and that's important to have. It's important to have uh, people around you, people you trust, people who are going to assist you and, and help you. No, no leader can do it alone. No one can do it alone. Um, but I got to be honest with you, within every man and woman, we kind of think we can do it alone. <laughs> and, you know, maybe when we start out, we're doing everything. You know, we're doing everything. But eventually... The excellence of that will start to, uh, you know, fail. And all of a sudden, we're missing or skipping or, 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 or forgetting certain things. And for a leader, he, he needs or she needs um, people around them to help them. And, and Solomon, again, he, he was going to be the blessed of all men. He was going to be the wisest one at this point. And he is... He's no fool. He realizes, I've got to have a cabinet. And so he sets his cabinets, his officials. We read there that he starts out, and I love this, guys. Please don't miss this. I know this is not the most exciting chapter, but I think we can bring out some, some neat insights. He begins, notice, on his list with the high priest. Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest, he was actually the high priest. The first on his list, the first one he chose to be part of his cabinet was a priest. He went to the spiritual first. He realized, I need a spiritual person here. I need the priest. I need the one who is the high priest. I need him there. I need him part of my, to be part of my cabinet. And I love that. And that's so important, guys. It's so important to have spiritual people around you. And then in verse 3, he, he speaks of these sons of Shisha. 
And they were scribes. That's the next important part he's th- he feels. The scribes. These were the day-to-day guys who would be around, among the king. They would uh, write out uh, the things and the edicts and, uh, you know, whatever. The, if the king promised this or promised that or, or any of the events that went on within the palace, within the king's life, these guys were the ones who were, would write it down. Now you think, well, what's the big deal about a scribe? Well, turn to book of Esther later on tonight. In Esther chapter 6, it was a scribe who wrote an event that took place in King Ahasuerus' life and there in the palace. It was an event that as, king, as the king was bored, he would bring the scribes out to read the, you know, the, 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 the daily or the monthly uh, 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 reports. And it was at that time as the king was, you know, kind of listening to all the reports that this scribe had written down. It told of a Jew by the name of Mordecai who prevented an, assassin, an, an assassination attempt against King Ahasuerus. And it was because of that scribe and what he wrote that we know the story of Esther. It saved the Jews. It saved them by the king saying, who was that? And it saved the Jews of that time. And you'll have to read the story if you're not familiar with it, but it's amazing. So don't just think, if God has called you to a certain ministry, it may not be one that comes with a pulpit. It may not be one that comes with uh, being on, on, a, on a platform. But don't think that your calling and your service goes unnoticed. It doesn't. God sees it. And I see those and I know those of you who are serving, those of you that, that maybe you don't think anybody, hey, it doesn't go unnoticed. And more importantly, God sees it. So he may have called you to be a scribe or, or, or to just be a servant, the one who, who takes the trash out or the one who fills the, the TP holders or the one, let me tell you, you're serving. You're serving the Lord. Because we're doing it as unto the Lord. Let's move right away. I didn't mean to spend so much time there, but I just want no, no, no ministry, no service for God is, is a low service. Now, when you get to platforms like the pulpit or the worship team or leadership, now it comes with more responsibility in a sense. But, but, but we're all servants, guys. Moving on, he speaks of his recorder, the son of Jehoshaphat. And he would record, he would be in the courts. He would be recording legal matters. And then, and then, finally, his commander over the army, Benaiah. Remember that guy? Yeah, he was, he was the son of Jehodiah. He was over the army. And that's important to have your commander in chief, you know, part of your cabinet. And then the priest. He had two other priests he, he makes mention of. That, these, this is what's important. Zadok and Abathar. One took care of the outside of the temple and one responsibility was on the outside and one responsibility was what was going on on the inside. And you need that. You know, today you, you, you sometimes, you see ministries where the assistant pastors or ministers, you have one that deals with all the outreach. And and you have another one that deals with all the inreach. And we let the Holy Spirit deal with the upreach. Amen. But anyway, that's what they have. This is he has somebody who's who's in charge of all the outside of the temple. Everything outside the temple, with temples being built, but at this point maybe the tabernacle, all the items there, and then he has a priest for the inside making sure all the incense are right, all the furniture is correct, everything's done with excellence and unto the Lord. Moving on quickly. (laughs) Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers, those governors that we'll speak about here in verse 7. We'll talk about these governors, these these who are uh, the officers. And uh, 
These, these are, this is the son of Nathan. Either Nathan the prophet or David also had a son by the name of Nathan. Either way, this was um, Zehud, the son of Nathan. He was a priest, and please notice the king's friend. We'll get back to that in a minute. And, and then verse 6, we have uh, Ahasher over the household. Um, you know, the things that went on in that area, and then we have this other guy over the labor force. So this is his cabinet. And again, I love the fact that Solomon put a spiritual leader first among his cabinet officials. I like that. And, and, and as I said, we should put God first in everything we do. Proverbs 16, 3, Solomon wrote this, and I like it in the NIV. It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. See, sometimes we get that mixed up. Uh, we establish plans, and then we give it to the Lord. Lord, bless it. And sometimes he's so grace, graceful to us, he'll, he'll do that. But most of the time, it's best to go to the Lord first. Offer it to God. Bring it to the Lord, and then he'll establish your plan. But do everything before God first. A wise leader knows how he or she cannot handle all the business alone, and they need gifted managers around to help and ensure the affairs they are responsible for and accomplishing things with excellence. But back to this this Zabud. He was a bud. He was a buddy. Zabud, the priest and the king's friend. A leader also needs friends. He needs buds. This guy was Solomon's friend. But notice it says he was a priest and a friend of the king. He was a godly friend. He was that godly one that probably could speak into Solomon and, and probably because he was either uh, his, his nephew from David or he, the prophet Nathan's son. Somehow they knew each other. They may have grown up together. And this guy probably could speak to Solomon straight up, straight forward. Because he loved him. And he was a priest as well. He has all these great people around him of faith. And here, this friend is so important to Solomon. Someone who, who just, wants, just wants him to be able to talk with and to share things with. Solomon wrote also in Proverbs 18.24, a man that hath friends... This is important. Listen, must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's the king name, sticketh. I like that. We know that friend is Jesus, right? We come to the New Testament and that friend is identified as Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. A good friend will speak truth to you. We may sometimes might might not want to hear it. But they'll speak truth to us because they love us. Jesus says, I call you friends. Friends build relationships. Friends build trust. Friends build uh, just this community of a family. And they walk together. Important for him to have a friend. Well, verses 7 through 19, I'm not going to read all these names, but Solomon divided the land into 12 regions, and he assigned a regional governor for each to supervise the monthly collection, as the King James would say, of vittles. Remember the Beverly Hillbillies? The vittles? <laughs> Actually, it's provisions. It's, it's provisions for the king and his staff. One of the guys there, as you read, it was Ben-Hur. Ben means the son of Hur. But we're familiar with Ben-Hur. Uh, not only was he a governor over the 12 regions, he also uh, acted and raced chariots on the side. No, he didn't. I'm just joking. But Solomon is not keeping with the traditional 12 tribal boundaries. 
And, and if you read it, Judah is not included in these regions providing for the king. That's going to play a part here. As right now, the kingdom is united. But once Solomon dies, the kingdom will become divided. And it will be because of favoritism that many will think that Solomon played in assigning these 12 governors and also not assigning them by their tribal um, areas. Verses 20 to 25, we see that, that Judah and Israel, that Israel itself is in a time of prosperity and peace again because of the la- fruit of the labor of David. David left Solomon blessed. It says that Judah and Israel were as, verse 20, were as numerous as the sand by the sea and the multitude eating and drinking and rejoicing. As numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude. What does that sound like, guys? What's the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham? In Genesis twenty two seventeen, God says, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. We have a map for you here where in verse 21, it gives us these boundaries. It gives us these, what God had given to them. It says, so Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river, not speaking of the river Euphrates, to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. And they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. And there in the map, we got that map. You can see the map. You can see the boundary. That's the land that was given to Israel. And that's a promise God spoke to Abraham on the extent of the land. In Genesis 15, 18, it says, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, or Abram, excuse me, saying, to your descendants, I, God, have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So under Solomon's reign, Israel possessed all of this promised land given to them. But the sad thing is, they possessed it, but many of them live in it. And even today, we're seeing the mistakes and we're seeing the failure of Israel completely taking this land as theirs. Some of of it was given away out of a, a good heart, good nature, but they gave it away to people um, who would turn against them. God says, this is your land to possess. Under Solomon's reign, Morris says of this temporary rule that it was a token of the final and permanent position they will have in the future. Again, he speaks of the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign with Christ we spoke of earlier. It's at that time when they will finally not only possess, but take hold of and live in and inhabit, and inhabit the land that they were given to them. And then notice this as we move on. The daily provisions that those 12 governors had to to provide. This is just daily. Now, verse 22. Now, Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores or 150 bushels of fine flour. 60 cores, that's 300 bushels of meal. Now, a bushel, I looked it up for you. A bushel is... um, 64 pints or eight gallons, one bushel. Eight gallons and looking at it as in a liquid form, 64 pints or eight gallons. Three, now you multiply that by 300. This is daily of meal, of cornmeal and flour. I mean, you, you can make some tortillas or you, can, or you can make some good muffins, man. That's a lot of muffins. 100 sheep. He says, 20 oxen from the pastures, that's grass-fed, and 100 sheep besides uh, deer and gazelle and 10 fatted oxen, that's corn-fed. And and, uh, and you got the deers in there for those of you Bambi killers out there. It's right there. It's Bible. You can do it. Gazelles, notice seers and roebucks, 
and fatted fowl. And then in verse 24, for he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, again, laying out for us from Tipshah even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace, notice, on every side all around. On every side all around. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree. I love that. From Dan as far as Beersheba all the days of Solomon. A vine and his fig tree, they dwell safe. This is a common metaphor for peace and security. See, Solomon, he, uh, he built Israel's trellis. And they planted, tended, and partook of the fruit of the vine and the fig tree. He built trellis for them, and they, and they uh, planted and tended. And they planted fruit for that trellis, the peace, so they could sit and not worry or look over their, their shoulder. That's a great time to be in. Verse 26, Solomon had 40,000 um, stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Second Chronicles 9 tells us it's 4,000. So there is a, a, uh, uh, an error there. Either it's 4,000 or 40,000, but it has nothing to do with the essentials of Christianity, nothing to do with anything that would, uh, that would remove the truth of the Bible. It's just either 40,000 or 4,000. Many scholars believe it's more of a 4,000. Can you imagine cleaning out those stalls, though, anyway? But please notice with me with this. It's very slight, and it's, it could just be read and moved on, but Solomon was in direct disobedience to Deuteronomy 17, 16. For it was in Deuteronomy 17, 16 that it says, as God was speaking of one day having kings in Canaan, he said... But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. The, 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 the question is, did Solomon realize that he was disobeying the word of God? Did he see that, that what he was doing, and he needed horses again. You want a good defense is an offense, right? You want to protect your land, and even though we're in safe, we're safety, we're we're enjoying a time of safety. You, you, but, but, four thousand or forty thousand. He was slipping, guys. He was slipping. He was fading, just so ever so slowly, into sin. Later on, we'll see in 1 Kings 10 that Solomon had horses imported from, guess where? Egypt. 1 Kings 10, 28. Solomon begins to compromise, inching a little by little in sin of disobedience. You know, Ravi Zacharias, and please be praying for Ravi. We all just found out, as you know, that he has incurable cancer. And we're praying that that God will keep him, you know, we, we, we pray a little bit, you know, uh, selfish, don't we? But we, we, in our hearts, we don't intend that to be. But he said this, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And we would wish that Solomon would, would catch that. I mean, he's a good guy at this point, but whether he sees it or not, he's starting to inch away. He's starting to fade away a little bit. And you give the enemy an inch, man, he's going to take as much as he wants. And you find yourself in a place where you never want it to be. And the cost is heavy. Moving on. Uh, verse 27 speaks of, uh, of these governors. Uh, each, each man in his month provided food for King Solomon for all who came to King Solomon's table. There was no lack in su- their supply. I hope not. He also brought barley and straw to, 
to the proper place for the horses and the steeds, each man according to his charge. So these were the governors. These were the guys that were in charge of providing. It was almost like a taxation for them rather than bringing the money. And I'm sure they taxed. Everybody was taxed, but it was their month. It was their time to bring the monthly provision for King Solomon and his staff and his people. Verse 29 talks about Solomon's exceeding wisdom. Notice this. And God gave, and just a reminder, Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding in the largeness of heart. He had compassion. Again, he had a heart. You know, this is what's strange about all this. This is a good guy. He's, he's a blessed man. He's, he's got compassion in his heart. This is like the sand of the seashore. I mean, God was so gracious to Solomon. God was so patient with Solomon. You know, he always gave him the patience and the time. I mean, he started so well, yet we'll find out he won't end that way. But it, wasn't, it wouldn't be because God didn't show him grace and, and patience. Verse 30, thus Solomon's wisdom, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all men of the east. It's coming to pass. Everything God promised him is now coming to pass. The men of the east were known for their wisdom, but Solomon excelled those of the Magi, those of, of the east. Uh, and then it says all the wisdom of Egypt. The word for wisdom there can also be uh, interpreted as skill. And we know the Egyptians were known for their architecture and education. This is verse 31, that he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Mo- Moselaskite. Oh, no, the Israelite. Excuse me. God bless you, Ethan. I know you're watching, man. And Heman. Now, who are those guys? Well, they, all we know is this, and, and Tom Price should know this. They, they uh, Ethan uh, wrote Psalm 88, and uh, um, and he man, <laughs> he wrote Psalm eighty nine. That's all we know. These other not quite, these other sweet guys, we don't know who they are. But his fame was in all the surrounding nations. What is this speaking about? It's speaking about what God spoke to him is coming to pass. His wisdom, his fame, his skill, his excellence. It's all coming to pass. Notice verse 32. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. 3,000. We have a collection uh, within 31 chapters. Some scholar says they're between, in each chapter, there's 25 to 35 proverbs. That's what we have. But he also wrote songs, 1,005 songs. Just want to make, make sure you got that five in there. David, we know, was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. So Solomon could be titled the sweet uh, um, proverbium of, of Israel. Or uh, I also wanted to, there was another word I wanted to use. Just the, you know, the sweet wise guy, the wise man of Israel, the sage. Um, but not only that, it speaks, look at verse 33. Also, he spoke of trees. The guy was a dendrologist, man. He was a scholar of dendrology. The cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of all. Am I saying that word right? Dendrology? That's good, people. Peep, you know, I've been studying under Matt. He spoke of also of animals. That he was a scholar of zoology. Of birds. He was a scholar of ornithology. I didn't think I knew that word, huh? Thank God for uh, Google. And enough creeping things, bugology. No, that's entomology. And of the fish, scholar of ethiology. Ethiology. <laughs> I mean, you probably ask, where did this guy have time? Where did he have time to study all of these things? Where did he, where did he find the time, you know? Well, he didn't have Netflix, VidAngel, PS5 or Xbox Series X in his days. He had books. And listen, he had the anointing of God. He had the anointing of God. And sometimes when ministry gets busy and and people are sick and you got to visit them and and you got a study to do and you got a sermon, God, I believe he does this. He accelerates 
our, uh, our time and gives us the points and the application and the illustrations quickly, you know. And it's a blessing. I've seen him do that. And then other times he says, oh, no, you got to study, Holmes, you know. But God can do that. And it seems like God did that for, for uh, Solomon. And the men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of the, his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. See, God kept his promise. God kept his promise in chapter 3. That's why I wanted to re, kind of review that. But is Solomon? Is Solomon following through where God says in chapter 3, verse 14, so if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. God is keeping his promise. He says, Solomon, you got a great heart, a compassionate heart, a humble heart. I'm going to make you the wisest person in this world. But we start seeing slip slide in a way. We start seeing, you know, and it's ever, and that's, as I said, sin does that. We, it just, it's, it's so, you know, very slow sometimes. And if we're not humble, continually to be humble and confessing our sins to God, knowing that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, we get into that, that place we don't, we don't notice that we've drifted. But today we know that wise men still seek him, right? Wise men still seek. That's the greater than Solomon. That's Jesus. I'm not just speaking about those wise men in Matthew chapter 2 who saw a star in the east and had come to worship the king of the Jews, no doubt being influenced by Daniel when Daniel was in captivity overseeing the Magi and spoke into these men and, and maybe his words were passed down and down. So whatever the case may be. But uh, the wise people that still seek him are all men and women, youth and children, even tonight, who seek after truth and they find it. Listen, you're only going to find truth in Jesus who is the way, the truth and the life. And the wisest truth that one can receive and believe is that Jesus has come to save mankind for their sins. And he proved it by what? By going to the cross, the cross of pain, an instrument of pain, an apparatus that was invented by evil people to bring pain, to bring excruciating pain and judgment to a person. The Romans perfected it. They took what was once invented and they perfected it to make it even more excruciating. That brought death. And Jesus came and was on that cross and he brought death in order for us to, to have life to live again after death and to live an abundant, blessed life before heaven on earth. I was thinking about that jailer again in Acts 16 who asked the most wisest question at the most certain time, at the most perfect time. Having been stopped from committing suicide. Maybe I'm speaking to someone today. He was going to commit suicide. And the two ministers that were there said, no, stop, don't do that. And this jailer, this man who stopped, cried out, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he did. He did the most wisest thing he, ever, he could ever do by responding and believing, and he was saved, and not only saved from taking his life on earth, but saved from his sins and prepared himself for heaven eternally. And that's why, as we, as Christians, partake of communion for, with these two simple elements, 
that represent the body that was broken for us. The body that took on my penalty for my, for my sins and the cup that was, that was spilt for me, covering me in total forgiveness. Remembering Jesus is the greatest act of love ever displayed for mankind. And right now we're going to take communion. When we do gather together, as I said, we'll be using these kinds of uh, communion. Uh, what you do, you peel back a plastic sheet that exposes for you the the bread. It tastes like remember when you were raised in more of an Orthodox or historical church. That's what it tastes like, but it's it represents his body. And then the cup, and you'll peel back another little covering, and that will expose to you the wine, well, I mean, the juice. Well, it depends on how long this has been sitting in the <laughs> in the warehouse. It may be wine, but God forgive us. But with these two simple elements, it speaks of his body and his blood. So, Father, we thank you for sending your only begotten Son into this world. And the reason is because you loved us. You loved us to death. Your Son's death. You gave us your Son. You only had one Son. And you gave him for us. Thank you, Jesus. And we think of our life and we think, Lord, of all that you've done for us. And I pray, God, if there's anybody slipping, that tonight they get things right with you. I pray for the prodigals tonight who are perhaps listening or watching. That they would come back to the Father who's waiting for them with open arms. And I speak for those, Lord God, who are in in the balance, Lord, have yet to receive you as Savior and God, that they would do it right now. Just receiving Jesus. If that's you, just say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Savior, my Lord. This, if you prayed that to receive Christ, this could be your, your first holy communion. Maybe you've taken communion in the past, but you were really never his until tonight. So with the bread and the cup, we partake. Remember our Savior. God bless you.